Dr. Jeffrey Hinden is a graduate of SUNY at Buffalo School Dental Medicine and Buffalo's VAMC residency program. He practices general dentistry with an emphasis on treating craniofacial pain, TMD, and also sleep disorders. Dr. Hinden is a founding board member of both the American Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry and the Foundation of Airway Health. He has developed a system of instrumentation to monitor heart rate variability and ANS balance. He uses this to help provide better understanding and care for patients with airway disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Hinden. Make sure everybody can hear me here. That's good. Good morning. All right. A little better than before. That's a hard act to follow. Fantastic information. Made me want to eat sushi looking at those last couple of things. So I don't know. Just me. Sorry. I had to go there. Anyway, I want to thank the Academy for having me come and, uh, and speak. I've been to several meetings. I was talking to somebody earlier how I'd been at the Louisville meeting uh, right after they had those floods, which I think was 95 or 96. Um, and I, I've learned a lot of information from the Academy over the years, and I hope I can give something back today. Um, just my brief conflict of interest, I'm a partner in HHS Systems. I developed the Hindex RV, which is a monitoring device for heart rate variability and physiologic parameters uh, that also has FDA approval. A little bit about myself, I'm a general dentist. I practice all phases of, of dentistry. Uh, I'm fortunate, and I'll put that word in quotes, to practice with uh, two family members, my wife and my father. Uh, so you can always get uh, <laughs> good opinions from your, uh, your family members about whether you did a good job or a bad job. I'm also doing research. Um, I'm involved at uh, Well Cornell in New York City, where we're doing research funded by the Tourette's Association of America on treatment of Tourette's with oral appliances. We just finished the pilot study and we're going to start doing uh, multi-center. I've also done some research at Northwestern looking at the effect of appliances on uh, physical performance. So, so we're going to talk about physiological dentistry, and uh, one of the things that I start off with and I talk to people about is imagine if your mouth was connected to the rest of your body. And I say that because a lot of times we look at things as dentists, like we're carpenters, we look at teeth, we look at this beautiful restoration, look at this, you know, and there's a whole body that's connected to that. Now I know people in this academy know better than that, but there are places where I go and people are like, what are you talking about? And we see over the years, and I see it, uh, from my mentors, when people would do things where they would place appliances in people's mouth, people would come back and they'd say how they had these other effects, they felt better. I mean, look what we do with, with sleep appliances for people and, and AHI scores. Um, and, the, and these other things were having these more far-ranging effects. And so one of the things I wanted to know was, or have wanted to know over my years in practicing is why has that happened? So where I started with this is that I had a family member that was in the hospital. Uh, they were connected to all the different uh, monitoring equipment. They said, you know, I left my appliance at home. Could you bring it for me? I said, sure. So I put the appliance in, and I see everything change on the monitors. The nurses come in. I'm like, give me the appliance. Can I take it out? And the nurses get everything settled back. They leave the room. And I was like, that was pretty interesting. We got a test, retest. That's a big thing in my life. So I put the appliance back in. Everything started to change. Nurses came back in. So I did it about 20 or so more times just to make sure I saw what was happening. And I said, how can we look at what's going on with us? You know, and in our in dentistry medicine, we have, we have a tough time. We have patients who tell us one thing or they're giving us an explanation of what they think is happening. And now we have the internet so they can absolutely have all the useful information when they come to talk to us about things. And we have to sift through what's going on. You know, you get somebody numb, they say, yeah, I feel numb. Somebody say, you know, in some places where I work, they say, my lip feels stupid. Great, what, what does that mean? Does that mean you're numb, you're not numb? When I was a resident, I had a patient come in. My chief said, you know what, you go, I want you to get in, get the medical history, I'm gonna be right back. I said, great. Go through the medical history, I say to the patient, are you taking any medications? Yes, I am. I'm taking peanut butter balls for my flea bites. So I wrote that down. Now my chief's coming back in, and I really don't want to tell him the guy's taking peanut butter balls. 
So I say, can you excuse me for a second? I just have to go get a new pen because I wanted to leave the room if I figured this out. So I'm saying peanut butter balls, peanut butter balls, phenobarbital. I go back in. Are you taking phenobarbital for phlebitis? Yeah, that's what I told you. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. So we had a tough time. And so I'm going to show you a video of a pain patient um, and what, we're, what we deal with here. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop they... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. I don't know what's thinking going on at all. I don't know, my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Come on, if you would just... Don't! So, you know, we get similar things that come into practice, and we, we have the issues too, because we look at things from our own uh, microscope sometimes. We don't see the big picture. I have a patient who comes to me, and she's telling me that she has jaw pain. That's why she was referred to me from a, a colleague of mine. You know, and I look at her, and we all see now that she has an occlusion where her upper front teeth are behind her lower front teeth, and you notice that there's a bit of bone loss on those lower front teeth. Um, and she goes through telling me the history that she's been to the periodontist. She's had several soft tissue grafts done, um, and she's had uh, bone grafts done. She still keeps losing bone in the area, and now she has this jaw pain. And I said to her, you know, did you ever notice that your upper teeth are behind your lower teeth? She said, yeah. I said, you know, how would you feel if we did something where maybe we moved them over the top? She said, that would be great. So we do that, and what happens is that we start to get, you know, we intrude the teeth a little bit, so now that we have a healthier periodontal condition, and she has no more pain because she's not trapped in that position. But the thing is, is that we were, somebody's looking at it, and they're looking at it through a very small lens. We need to look at a bigger picture, and we need to pay attention to what's going on. By Jay to center, holiday. Line to deep center. And he's out. Big <laughs> demand. So I, I coach baseball, so that's a particularly big thing for me. But if you look at this patient and you see what we, when she comes in, what she has there, you know, what is this telling us? We see that on her tongue. Is it telling us that, you know, she pushes things on her tongue? Is it that she squeezes her teeth there? And this is somebody who came to me for pain. She's 46 years old, she doesn't have any other medical types of problems, her blood pressure is normal, and she has no history of trauma. You know, but when we look at her teeth, you can see that she's got some chips on her upper front teeth, lower front teeth, she's got some spaces forming, her lower molars are canted lingually. So where does her tongue have, what room or where does it have to go? It's got nowhere to go, right? So now we're getting impressions of her teeth on her tongue. She tells me that she's got neck pain on her left, she grinds her teeth, which we should be able to tell from some of those things. Anxiety attacks, migraines, poor sleep. She fills out a medical history, uh, I'm sorry, a pain history for me, and she's got just about every line and then the back of the paper filled out as well because she's in pain all over the place. She, so when I'm, we, we check her, she's got multiple painful muscles, she's got limited range of motion, everything that you might expect. But then what we did was, we started to say, well, what else is going on? And we hooked up her to our, our monitoring system. And her resting heart rate, resting heart rate, while she's sitting doing nothing, is 111 beats per minute. Now, if you're sitting there and your heart is racing like that, you're going to feel anxious. You're not going to feel good. All these other things are going on. We also had EMGs hooked up. And we see that they're firing higher on the left side than on the right side. 
which is where she's having pain. So her muscles are definitely tighter in that area. She had been treated before with an upper night guard. She had seen a chiropractor. They were doing things with blood pressure medications for the uh, migraines, but the things were not working. And the upper night guard was interested in that when she wore it, she said it didn't make her feel better. It actually made her feel worse, and she felt more anxious when she wore it. So we insert a new lower appliance. We insert the appliance, and within five minutes, her resting heart rate goes down to 62 beats per minute. Now, the interesting part there is now she tells me, you know, I don't feel as anxious. Well, your heart stopped beating as fast as it was. It's not because of my sterling personality or anything like that. It's your physiology. But that's the piece that I'm trying to get through, is that we feel things. Our, physio our anatomy causes our physiology to occur. And when our physiology happens, what happens is people come up with explanations for why they feel certain things. If my heart is racing, I'm going to feel, the word I'm going to put with that is anxious, not comfortable. You know, I feel more relaxed when my heart is not beating that fast. And anyway, she wears the appliance, her heart rate decreases, she has less pain, you see the EMGs drop off, um, and she has no more anxiety attacks, and, uh, and her migraines have diminished. Now, I did this case about 14 or 15 years ago. But this is where we were starting out and things that we were looking at. Now, what was interesting is that when I put the data on a graph, we were looking at something called heart rate variability. And what we had was, with no appliance, her heart rate variability was up over here. With that upper appliance, her heart rate variability, I'm sorry, this is right here. Heart rate variability is here with uh, the upper, her heart rate variability went down. And then with the lower, her heart rate variability went up. And that's an important piece we're going to get into explaining what those things were. But, you know, there's, there's literature out there that says that maxillary night guards will increase people's AHI or sleep problems if they have them, so you have to be careful when people have those type of sleep issues. Is everybody here, anybody here treat sleep? Raise your hands, no, a few, okay. Um, you guys all should. I mean, with everything that you all do, it, it's, it's a great thing that you can do for your patients. When I first started showing those slides that patients come with the scalping on their tongue, what was interesting was that a lot of people would say, well, how do you know that, that that's a problem? How do you know that it's, it's anything? There's nothing in there. Well, literature has come out since I used to show that slide, showing that when people have uh, signs and symptoms of uh, sleep apnea, along with the scalping of the tongue, it can be very highly predictive. The other thing is that pharyngeal dilator muscles, of which the tongue is one, are more active in awake people who have sleep apnea. And I know it says SAHS there, this is from an English uh, textbook. And what was interesting is that if you look at this, this cone beam, and I know a cone beam is just a picture in time, but if you look at it, the, the one picture we have where the airway is uh, closed off, and then with the patient with an appliance in, you can see that the airway is a little bit bigger. But the bigger take-home picture here is that basically if you look at the back of the tongue here, the soft tissue compared to here, you see how smooth it is on the picture on the outside here compared to here? So the muscle, the tongue is a muscle, it's a fan-shaped muscle, and it contracts, what does it do? It looks like that, it looks all crunched. So what's happening, the second thing is that when we get the patient in a better position where their airway is open, what happens is now those muscles don't have to contract because the brain is saying, my airway is, is open, I don't have to basically sit there and keep that control. So what are we looking at? So what I look at is that basically I'm looking at two respiration rates, abdominal and thoracic. I'm looking at two EMGs, these are surface EMGs on the masseters. This is a uh, sexual analysis of heart rate variability. This is my heart rate. And this is my EKG that I'm running. The EKG leads all off the arms. So not, nobody takes off their clothes in my office. This is the overall heart rate variability or interbeat interval. This is a plot of respiration rate versus heart rate. And then I have a webcam in there so that I can see. We leave patients while well, they're monitored for five minutes, and I want to go back and remove any artifact. I can see if they moved. Or if I'm lecturing, you can see what happens. I'm going to show a couple of things with that. We have the EMGs, which we have an algorithm, which we can tell uh, whether one side is a little higher than the other. And then the last thing that we're looking at is we have a biofeedback screen, which is basically allows us to have our patients be able to do some homework, uh, doing breathing exercises. What happens is when they get in the right, right breathing range, that little airplane flies around the mountain. Um, and when it goes out, basically, the, the airplane stops. So it's a game that they can practice. So, what are we talking about? The autonomic nervous system, all right? And if you're reading literature now, there's more and more things coming up about how important the autonomic nervous system is to the different things that we do, not only in, in medicine, but in dentistry as well. And before, when you were giving out the code for 
for the Wi-Fi, when you said Vegas, I thought you said Vegas, V-A-G-U-S, but that's because my mind is focused on autonomic nervous system all the time. But how quickly does it work? You know, why did we see that change in that patient um, right away when we put the appliance in? Like, almost like this, you know, the, the wall is pretty, pretty close there, and otherwise if I were in, if I were trying to say that, I'd get the wall and I'm break something, so I just, I just ran to, to save myself. And... So I can guarantee you, when that guy comes off his bike in the turn, and he's doing probably 110 miles an hour, he's not thinking I need to increase my heart rate, I need to increase my respiration rate, I need to dilate my pupils, right? That, those things are happening automatically. He may be thinking after, how do I clean my leathers out? <laughs> but that's after, okay? So we're talking about heart rate variability. So what is heart rate variability? So the control of the cardiovascular system is achieved by the autonomic nervous system in part. And that's basically broken down into the sympathetic, which is our fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest. And basically, we, those are controlled by the sympathetic. So we're going to increase our heart rate, our respiration rate. It's the stuff that gets us ready to go. And the parasympathetic are going to slow things down. And I, obviously, I, we could go on. That's a lecture in and of itself on, on autonomics. But basically, heart rate variability looks at the changes. Heart rate is a, a measure of how the heart is beating over an epoch of time. So in effect, it's an average. So if I'm 65, 66, 64, 65, over a five second epoch, it's gonna be 65. Heart rate variability looks at each of the changes that occur between each beat, and it measures it basically in time. And it's a very significant uh, piece of, of uh, information that we get now. There are 21,000, I forget how many articles, and every time I lecture, I update that. I lectured a couple times this year, it started out, they were at under 21,000, and there's just hundreds of articles come out in all phases of medicine, and dentistry now as well. So if we look at what we're measuring, we have an EKG, and we have that big spike that comes up in the QRS complex, the R. And what we measure in heart rate variability is that we're measuring the distance in milliseconds between each of those. Now, in a healthy person, there's gonna be a more variability. I know that sounds like it's a difficult thing to look at because we look at heart rate all the time. Heart rate variability, you want to see more variation. And so we want to see it be uh, a little, it might be long here, short here, long here, and we want it to be all different types of things. A high or increased heart rate variability is a good thing. All right, so I'm going to say that a bunch of times today. Increased heart rate variability is a good thing. So my, my rubber band analogy. You take a rubber band 10 centimeters, I stretch it to 11, stretch it to 12, 15, 18, and now all of a sudden I go to 22. The rubber band is in good shape because I built in flexibility into the system. Take the same rubber band, I cycle it at 12 centimeters, 12, 12, 12, 12, now go to 22, the rubber band will break because there's no flexibility in the system. And the same thing is predictive and, and shows why it's predictive in our bodies. Uh, heart, if you had an MI, the chances of, of having a second MI if you have a low heart rate variability is about 96%. Uh, and that's independent, independent of any other risk factor. So the way we measure heart rate variability, there are two ways, all right? There's through, one is an overall or time domain, which is how we look at, at the distances of all of those little R to R measurements we took and we take a standard deviation. And the other is through a frequency analysis where we break down all the electrical signals that go into making each one of those pieces. And what happens is we, we measure that. So it's like looking at light. You look at either the brightness of the light or you put a prism on it and you break it down into the different colors. The, very, the, the frequency analysis, we know that in the very low frequency band, what happens is those are where you see your apneic events, your restless leg events, your strokes, your heart attacks, anything bad, you're going to see a spike when that occur because that's the sympathetic nervous system basically spiking. Okay. So the other thing is it's important to have good data. You see that there are two EKGs here. One is basically not readable at all. The one next to it is readable. So you need to have a way of taking out the garbage. If you put garbage in, you get garbage out. I'm sure you would know that much better than I do. So sympathetics decrease your heart rate variability. If we increase the sympathetic nervous system, we're going to de decrease our heart rate variability. And we know that there is a lot of literature that's coming out saying how important it is for us as dentists to know that the physiologic things that go on in our patients are important to monitor and keep an eye on. And these are just articles. I have tons of articles to back up all these different things. But it's more and more in literature is picking it up in dentistry. 
And heart variability in dentistry has been associated with malocclusion, TMJ problems, joint dysfunction, um, dental surgery, sedatives. Uh, we know that patients who have TMD have lower heart rate variability at rest. So um, what's interesting is that when we can do things with our TMJ patients, we see their HR to be increased, their pain goes away, they do better. And I'm going to show cases of that. And then heart rate variability and jaw position. And these were some of the first articles that I started to see when I started this journey a number of years ago. The first was a Xiaomi article. He's a, uh, a dentist um, out of Japan. And they looked at what happened when people were given mandibular advancement appliances for sleep. And they looked at frequency analysis when people had, uh, they had less sleep apnea and they had a decrease in that very low frequency range. That's the area where we have more of those apneic events. Sure. Peruzzi is a cardiologist in Italy who worked with dentists. Um, which was great because uh, what they did is they, they made mandibular advancement appliances, measured heart rate variability and AHI through a PSG polysomnogram, um, and then sent them three months later with the oral appliance, had them come back, measured heart rate variability and a PSG. Every one of the patients who had an increase in heart rate variability had a decrease in their AHI score and they were actually happening free. Um, the last was anesthesiologists who had patients who were about to go under uh, and what they did is they moved their jaws in different positions and lo and behold, when you brought their jaw forward, their heart rate variability increased. Of course, it's one of the first moves we make when we do CPR. So when I've, when I've lectured before, anesthesiologists, they're like, yeah, we do that. We see that stuff all the time. Let's try to get that stuff translated over to everything else. People who have malocclusions have a decreased heart rate variability. Now, I put in the whole quote here because they felt that, felt that malocclusion causes chronic stress that can affect heart rate variability. I'm going to talk about what stress is in a little while, but it may also be the position of the teeth and what's happening with their jaw, based on all the things that I just told you before. We take this case, and this is a case that my wife worked on. Um, you have basically a very contracted arch, and what happens is she does some expansion. We measured overall heart rate variability from where the patient started to where they ended, and there was an increase in heart rate variability. We looked at a frequency analysis. And what we had was we saw that there was less of that very low frequency, the bad stuff, um, compared to when they finished. And this is a case by Dr. Kelly, who's here with me. You can see the difference in the patient's face just by doing uh, orthotropics, which is basically doing things to do expansion and bring the jaw forward. And there was an increase in heart rate variability, and I think facially, the patient looks a lot better and they're healthier. So if we do good things, can we do something bad? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a patient, and I'm going to put appliance in their mouth that's going to retract their jaw. And you're going to see how quickly the, the difference comes on. So if you see, there's this purple that's going up and down. The lines are pretty wide. I'm going to bring an appliance into the frame. I'm not going to leave the frame, nothing up my sleeve. I put it into her mouth. When she closes her mouth, you're going to see that her jaw goes back. And watch what happens to that purple line, how small it gets right away. So that's how quickly the autonomic nervous system works. So I think it's good to show, you know, we can show good cases and how things work out, but we can also do things that don't help our patients as much, maybe. Um, I believe that that can be the case and we need to look at those things. So there's a great, um, the National Heart Blood Lung Institute put out a paper, a position paper in 2001. You can go online to their website, it's still downloaded. I would urge you to do that. Um, it's a really interesting article because they basically put together autonomic nervous system, TMD, sleep, and patient problems. And it's really some really interesting pieces they put together. Uh, there's an article that came out that in Bruxelles and patients, sympathetic cardiac activity was higher than in volunteers. And they felt that it was increased stress. So, why is this patient Brux? She has seven millimeters of overjet. Okay, seven, almost a full centimeter. This is what it looks like when her teeth come together when she brings them forward. They fit perfectly. So what are the causes of bruxism that we've read about? Occlusal problems, sleep arousals, personality traits, psychosocial factors, and my favorite, make sure it's not too loud here, stress, right? So is stress a cause? There's a number of articles that would disagree with that. This is just a sampling of a few. But is it stressful to not breathe? If I put my hands over your face, what are you going to do? You're going to try to get my hands off your face. Right? We know that this is out of uh, G. Levine's lab up in, uh, in Canada. 
that they see these rises in rhythmic masticatory muscle activity when people are about to have, uh, when they, they're going to clench more when their breathing amplitude increases more. So they're trying to get that breath. They're trying to basically get that going. And that is all moderated by the autonomic nervous system. So they said that there's sympathetic activity, and I could show you article after article of how sympathetics basically increase before a brush. So, same patient now. She shows up to me because she's having pain in the lower right, a lower left, excuse me, second molar that had root canal treatment, um, and it's it's sensitive to percussion. There's no apical pathology. I'm not going to get know about root canal, so I'm not going to get into that piece of it. She had a left clogged ear for 11 months that she totally began after she had a severe cough. She had some jaw tightness on the left side. Now this is what she's telling me, some jaw tightness, and you're going to see what she wrote on her pain papers. She'd seen three or four, uh, three ENTs, had four courses of antibiotics. The neurologist noted no pathology. She had MRI of her ear and her brain, no pathology. Hearing was normal. She sees the chiropractor every week, um, and she snores. This is her pain. She writes down, uh, Moderate, was it moderate pain there, and severe radiating pain on the left side. So clinically, she can only open her mouth 24 millimeters. All right, not very much. She has worn dentition, we saw that in the pictures. She has no click on top. She has a deviation on the left on opening. It's like we said before, she's a class two with seven millimeter of overjet. We see that her EMGs, when we put it in, are basically fire higher on one side. So I take a, uh, a, a tomo, and we see that her joint on one side is completely destroyed compared to the joint on the other side. So all my patients who I treat for uh, TMJ, every one of them gets an MRI. I send her for an MRI. She's got an anterior dislocation of, of the right without reduction, so it's out. It's not going back. We saw the diminutive size. She has a, a left side has no abnormality, but that's where she has her pain. That's because she's blown out the joint on the right side. Right? These are the MRIs uh, with her in. Open mouth position, closed mouth position, you can see the disc is forward of the joint. Anyway, we put in the appliance, she tells us that she feels less tension in her jaw, her ear feels less clogged, her breathing is easier, she can swallow better, and now she can open 38 millimeters without pain, all right? Which is pretty good compared to, and it's not where I want to be, but it's better than 24 where we started. So when we do, we can do a statistical breakdown, and what we do is we see that her heart rate variability increased uh, when we put the new appliance in. And this is just another way of looking at the data. The point array or scatter graph, the more scatter you have, the more uh, variability you have, and that's what we're looking for. She had more variability when we put the appliance in. And again, uh, just another way to look at the data, trend report, but basically there's an increase. So she tells me that she has no pain. Um, we're doing better. This is a follow-up. And she uh, opens to 45 millimeters, which is plus 21. Visual analog scale, she has 0 out of 10 with opening. Um, and we keep trying to get her to go for an MRI, but she doesn't want it because she feels better. So heart rate variability has been widely reported to be an independent risk factor for all sorts of things, including cancer and, and mortality. A number of articles came out uh, that showed that if you have a low heart rate variability having, after having a course of, of cancer treatment, that your chances of survival are very low, and, and there was one in brain cancer, there was one in breast cancer. And it's frightening because I have a friend who does research in it, and they were, were telling me about that. Um, heart rate variability changes as we get older. All right? It decreases, unfortunately. But if we exercise and take care of ourselves, we can actually increase it. And then the question is, is there a change when we do things with orthodontics or appliances? And I think we, we, we see that there is. Um, heart rate variability has an inverse relationship to inflammatory markers. So if you have a low heart rate variability, you'll have a high amount of in inflammation. And that means you have more sympathetic outflow. So what does that mean if somebody is going to try to be getting healthier after surgery or something like that? They're not going to do as well. So it's one way to look at, at those types of things. Or if you're going to talk about detoxing and things like that, higher sympathetic outflow, they're probably going to have more trouble trying to detox. OSA and heart rate variability. People with OSA have lower daytime heart rate variability independent of anything else. And then if you tie all those things together, you can see that people have more sympathetic outflow, lower heart rate variability. So we take a patient who comes to me who has cardiac problems, he's overweight, um, he has an obstructive uh, sleep apnea, he had a, a full overnight sleep study done, and we look at basically, we have the different screens going for him, and we look at what the different things are going on. But if you look at how flat 
the lines here for his heart rate variability, where before in that young person you saw there was a lot of variation. There's almost no variation here. All right, and this person has had sleep apnea for a number of years. And there's that spike right here, which is at very low frequency, which is the stuff you see right before an apneic event. You see how that spike. If you compare that to a marathon runner, at how much they have going on there, look how much variability. Look at where the spike is. It's farther over. They're more parasympathetic. They're healthier. And that's the difference in things that we're looking at. And so this is just me, I have a patient laying down in the chair. And what we can see is we can also watch how they breathe. Sometimes people who have excessive daytime sleepiness will fall asleep in the chair. And I'm sure you've all had it when you're working on them. They tell you they don't have a sleep problem, but they're out like that and they start snoring. So one of the things you'll see is they may reverse breathe. You'll see that their, their abdomen and their, and, and, and their uh, chest are at two different levels and they'll, they'll go against each other so they don't breathe as well. And that's basically one of the issues that goes on. So it's one of the other reasons I use that. So this guy, what he had was, he had a sleep appliance that was made for him, and when we, we put it on a, a trend report here, what we saw is that basically with no appliance, and with the appliance he was wearing, they were almost exactly the same. Well, what I noticed that when he had the appliance in, it was a little bit off, and I said, do you mind if I adjust it? He said, sure, and right after that, we basically adjusted the appliance, and we saw that he, he was doing better. I, a week later, we ran another trend report on him without wearing the appliance, and his heart rate variability increased to that point from here in just a week of wearing the appliance that was better for him. We fabricated a new appliance for him, and now he's up to here. And he's doing better, he's losing weight, um, a lot of other good pieces going along with that. Uh, this is some of the information or study that John Kelly is working on. We're looking at patients with AHI scores, this is people who have apnea. And what he does is what we call physiologic by using actually the physiology of the patient to guide where they take the bite registration. And what happens is we see that there's been a decrease in their AHI scores. And the two pieces here, this person had nasal surgery that was done and that helped them get down. And the other one, the tech adjusted the appliance from where he'd taken the bite and their AHI went up. So he went against where the physiology would have sent it. So we know that mercury levels decrease heart rate variability, okay, and there's a lot of studies that show that. Um, we also know that basically, uh, again, mercury decreases blood pressure, or, or impacts on blood pressure, I'm sorry, and decreases heart rate variability. You don't want to have a low heart rate variability. Remember, high heart rate variability is good. Um, and then again, this is, I know it's, it's fish consumption, but again, it goes to mercury, and again, high heart rate variability Right, you want to have low mercury levels, the high mercury levels, low heart rate variability. So again, take another patient who comes in with pain. He's got pain on the left side, difficulty opening, chewing, speaking, he has headaches, neck pain, fills out our charts for us. We do our MRI. She's got uh, uh, subluxation of the left with uh, partial reduction, so it goes back in part way. So she does appliance therapy, uh, acupuncture. My sister is an acupuncturist, craniosacral therapist. So I have a, a lot of good people I can deal with, um, which is nice. She goes uh, to physical therapy, has restorative work done. Um, and then what happens is we, we basically make her an appliance. She wears it, we send her back for post-treatment MRI. She gets recaptured of the disc, she's doing better. But we had measured this whole thing along with the heart rate variability. The bad part, you know, if you look at this, if we're looking from just a teeth point of view, if she went out to another dentist, they say, oh my God, she has a posterior open bite. I mean, Brutal, just terrible. She was in terrible pain, but now she's supposed to be open by it. And anyway, we say, well, we can do something like that. She has all porcelain work on. We make a couple of these little overlays that go over that. We want to test and see how things work. And basically, you get them in. She's happy. She's doing better. And then we can go ahead and make the final prosthesis when we get to that point. And if you want to look at the dental part, it's the, my, my dental pictures. So what we did is we measured her heart rate variability and her heart rate. And we looked at the different things. We saw that there was an increase in her heart rate variability and her heart rate um, when, when she wore the appliance. So we did pre-appliance, post-appliance, and we can see that the number, the SDNN increase, SDNN is that overall heart rate variability. And what we did then is that we inserted the, the, uh, those appliances, those little things, we measured it. We wanted to make sure that was a good place, we re-measured it, and then we did an insert of the final abutments, and we increased the heart rate variability even more. So we were keeping an eye on her physiology along with everything as we were going along.
And then this is just a trend report of where we started and where we want. The line going up is the overall heart rate variability. The others are frequency analysis that we were talking about before. And again, different ways to look at this. Make sure I'm doing okay here. Good, okay. So performance in PT. You know, I work on a lot of people who have problems. I'm sure you guys do too. It's kind of nice to do some of the other things where we get to work with athletes. Um, these are some pictures of my kids when they were younger. Um, but we look at things that we can do. We have uh, we make mouth guards, appliances, sometimes for pro athletes, where we measure their heart rate variability. And when we can increase their heart rate variability, we see that they've had more flexibility, uh, more strength, different things. You've probably seen articles out there on different types of appliances and things like that. But there's actually been studies to do that show that when you get a bite a certain way, uh, that there's less knee flexion, there's uh, more strength. So we're looking at how we can quantify that and objectify and get numbers with that. So we did a couple of uh, little studies on our own. Uh, we worked with a, uh, a really great physical therapist and trainer who works with a lot of NFL players. He's down in Ocala, Florida. I hope he's going to be okay uh, with the storm coming. But what we did is we had him line up uh, six of his, of his uh, athletes. And what we did is we went in one room, we made an appliance based on their physiology, and we had them do some different testing. And what they did was they had this uh, a functional movement scale test where basically they would step over things. They have different things that they can measure so that they can get a quantifiable amount. They would then go into another room where they did visual, ta visual tactical training. So they stand in front of this big board, I'm going to show in a little while, and they hit on the different lights that come up, and they want to see uh, increases in it. They want to see where your reaction time is, um, and then there's also a memory thing, uh, how it goes. And what we want to see is we want to see if there were changes. So they, we have little videos here, I'll turn the volume off. But basically what they do is they have this little scale, this is called a Y balance test. You step up on it with one foot and push out. This is before the appliance. And then when she's got the appliance, right, you can see with one, she actually holds onto her hips. She didn't realize she was doing this. We videotaped every one of the patients that were there, um, and we tried to make it. We were trying to figure out where we're going with this, so we're going to present this to different uh, teaching institutions so that we can do more studies with it and see where we can get more quantifiable results. So what we found was that every one of the people who had um, the FMS test, that's the functional movement scale done, that they had positive changes. Now the functional movement scale is used in the NFL um, to measure whether a patient will be, a, a, a football player will be on um, injured reserve by the end of the season and they have all these statistics that go with it. If you score, I think it was at 16? At 16 or less, the, the probability of being on injured reserve is something like 50, 50 something percent. Um, so they want to get everybody above. So they do at the beginning of training camp and the a after training camp uh, to see where they're going to be. When we made these appliances, we saw that there were changes in those right away. Um, and 50 of people who had asymmetries, the symmetries were, were corrected, and those were people, um, and this was something that Bert, Bert and I actually lectured on this to physical therapists, but it was when people would stand a certain way in order to do a movement so that it was asymmetrical. So uh, he, he showed a, a picture of a, a person holding a, a piece of wood, he has them bent down, and they bend like this, yet when they lay on their back, they can get everything bent the right way because they have support for their back. Um, and that, that's basically where we get injuries from. Uh, the Y balance test that I showed you before, all six people had a change in their composite score. So what happened uh, after that was uh, we, were, we were working on it and there was a, a father of a, a patient with uh, Down syndrome heard what we were doing and he sent us uh, a letter and he said, do you think you can do something for my son? And we were like, well, you know, we don't know, but you know, we'll certainly try it. Now, this is not a study. This is this is my own clinical experience, so I'll just lay that out there. What was interesting for us was that his son, uh, though communicative, did not tell us whether something felt right or wrong. So we were going completely off of objective data. And so what we did is we had video of that, and you can see me in the foreground. It's my big gigantic head in front of the camera. Um, and what we did is we were picking a position for his bite uh, to take while we were watching the data. Anyway, we didn't hear from them for a while, but six months later we get a video from the dad, from the physical therapist saying, you know, this appliance is amazing, look at all these things, and it was great because she did hit with him doing the test, with the test and without the test, um, uh, with the appliance, without the appliance, doing a different test, and there were corrections in his asymmetries and his movements, so it was really, it was helping him. 
what was nice for us was that it was completely objective because we were not able to get any information. Does that feel good? Is it the right position? All these other things. It was basically strictly off the data. And I apologize because my video is not playing. But the, the basically the visual uh, and, phys and physiologic balance of clients, basically one of the other things they were looking at was the board. What they did is they had the board and the lights come on. You want to hit it as fast as you can. And what they do is they want to see how many taps for 30 seconds you have. So everybody but one had more taps after wearing the appliance. And their reaction time for every one of them decreased. So they were able to hit the things faster. Um, and then they're also their visual recall was important. And that's important for athletes. And I, I have to apologize because I don't remember exactly why. But basically, you want the more recall and memory you have, the better you are at sports. And so they want to do things and it has to do with your vision. So they have a little thing that spins and basically shows different numbers and letters and you have to remember the sequence as it comes back. Um, I'm going to show you one more patient here. This is a patient that comes to me because he was having a jaw pain, grinds his teeth, he's clicking, pain in his muscles, he has trouble with different things. He has a lot of muscle pain, he has a lot of twitching. Uh, he has neck pain, he has fatigue, headache, shoulder pain. Clinically, he's a class three um, with uh, over jet of two over by one, opens to 45 millimeters with three out of 10 pain, and he protrudes to seven millimeters. His right lateral, left lateral is seven to six. To me, I would like to see a 12 to 12, so that's a limited range of motion. Um, he has a quick pop on his left side, with lateral movements in pain, and he's pain on palpation. We sent him for an MRI. He has anterior subluxation of the left meniscus, one on the open mouth, um, and limited translation and a right side of the fusion. All right. His medical history, he also has Tourette's. Um, so he was a real trooper because he got through the MRI and he has probably 60 ticks per minute, um, which when you meet somebody who has that thing, it's really hard to complain about anything because I don't know how he gets through his day um, doing the things that he does. So he has arm extension ticks, uh, which is very strong. And he let me show you this video. So if you watch this video, So you can see all the movements that he's making right now, those are all ticks that he's having, and they, they're basically, they're constant. There's head moving, there's an arm movement that he's gonna have that basically almost knocks him out of his chair. But if you look at his breathing, he breathes, his respiration rate is kind of all over the place. His heart rate is all over the place. You can see where his uh, overall heart rate variability is in the purple. Um, but he's having ticks still the entire time. And you'll watch that he just keeps moving and moving and moving. Right, so we put an appliance in, and if you watch him now with the appliance, there's a lot less movement, but his physiology is also better. You'll see his respiration rate will come on once the, uh, the reading start. So his system has calmed down. So I work with uh, the psychiatry department at uh, Wild Cornell Hospital, and they have been awesome. Um, because I go with them to psychiatry meetings to lecture. And people are like, what is, what is DDS? So I'm like, well, you know, I'm a dentist. Um, and and what's, what's really been interesting is that they've allowed me to talk about and help them. Make, I, I helped write the IRB for the, for the study that we were doing. And some of the initial work that was done with this is uh, by somebody who spoke here before, Brendan Stack, who I think everybody here probably has heard of. Um, I worked with Brendan. Um, for years, um, and I know him, he's a mentor of mine. Um, and so he was looking at it being this reflex in the brain that occurs and it, and it causes the, the body to have ticks, and it's basically circumvented with the appliance. I think it may be a little simpler than that. Um, I think that when we do things, anything in somebody's mouth, whether it's a TMJ appliance, a sleep appliance, a crown of orthodontics that we have to do with changing people's airway. And when you change airway in a good way or a bad way, you're going to affect people's physiology. When I told this to the psychiatrist, they were like, well, you know, that sounds interesting. You know, how do you know that's true? I said, bring me a, a patient who's got really bad tics, and I'll tell you why I think it's true. I brought them in. I had them do biofeedback training, just doing breathing exercise, and their tics stopped. And I said, no, I haven't done anything to them. I didn't give them any medications. I didn't do any of these other things. But look what's going on. Now, what I have is, I, I talked about it before, is the test retest. I have a hypothesis and I constantly keep trying to test it, retest it. And if I'm wrong, I want to be able to change it. 
Anyway, an article came out about two years ago, finally, that said that kids who have Tourette's have higher sympathetic outflow, which I've been telling them for five years. And as soon as it came out, I think I got it at like 12.01. <laughs> I happened to be up because I have my own sympathetic issues. And I emailed it to them and I said, see, this is what I'm telling you about. And they were like, Jeff, I think you're right. And we moved on to look at other things. And we looked at some of the medications that have worked and not worked for Tourette's, and they all affect the sympathetic nervous system. Now, they're so awesome, they're wondering how it can help patients who have ADD, anxiety, and all these other things, because maybe it's the sympathetic outflow and we can make changes. Um, you know, there's Stephen Sheldon, who's a very well-known pediatric sleep specialist at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, got up and gave a lecture and said that ADHD and ADD may be actually misdiagnosed as being a sleep problem a high percentage of the time. And they've taken, there have been studies that show that they do things with kids and you get them early, treat them early, they don't have any problem later on. They actually go from being very low performers in school to being very high performers. And again, you've changed the airway. Um, Heart rate variability is a huge, huge subject. And uh, I've uh, touched on it a little bit here. See, I've got my motorcycles to work. I've touched on it a little bit. I mean, it's the kind of thing I can talk about just heart rate variability for hours at a time. Motorcycles are awesome gyroscopes, so it takes a little bit for them to go down. <laughs> so, anyway, I covered a lot of material quickly. I'm around today if you have any other questions, and then I'll be at the speaker forum. And I ran it perfectly on time or even earlier, so, but you had a schedule. So, anyway, thank you.